Hey there, I'm Becky, and welcome to Literary Escapes with me, Becky. Today's episode is an author interview that I did in my membership book club, Literary Escape Society. If you enjoy hearing the behind the scenes story about your favorite books, you might want to join the Literary Escape Society. There'll be a link in the show notes if you'd like to check it out. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Fiona Valpi. We are so excited to have you here. And it is such a gift we were talking about before jumping in here that we were able to do this, that we have the technology that people from all around the world are able to join us and get together and talk to an author that we all read the same book. And it's fantastic. And it's it's fantastic from an author's point of view to be able to connect with readers so much more directly, ironically, at a time when we are exactly. <laughs> so much more apart. So great wonders of modern technology. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I love living in these day and times and yeah, all the amazing books that we have available to us. And yeah. So um, how long have you lived in Scotland? Is this your home? Um, been Scotland is really my home. Yeah, I am. Um, I've lived in many, many different places, but Scotland has always felt like the the place where my roots kind of um, refuse to let go, you know, wherever you go in the world. So I have lived in France um, for seven years. I lived in South Africa for six years. I lived in Canada for two years. I've been south of the border in England, but um, Scotland is where I keep coming back to, and I love okay. it. And yeah, this is my home now. This is nice. now that now that I get to choose completely. This is where I choose. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, a, that's awesome. I love that. It's funny where we wind up, isn't it? I, yeah. And, and I like the sense of home and. Um, it's so important, isn't it? Yeah. Where, you know, wherever you go, wherever you are in the world, I think we all know that sense of home when we have it but I think we also all know that that sense of home when it's missing Mm -hmm. and and you can live in a place for many years and it and it doesn't feel like home I agree I agree been there done that (laughs) and that's life we just do it it's the way it is sometimes you you know some sometimes places are important just to get us to the next step so yes true okay yeah so how did you get into writing well I started when I lived in France. So that that move to France, which happened fairly late in life. Um, my two sons were, were grown up to the stage where they were just finishing school and, and okay. going off to college. And um, my then husband and I, because we've since got divorced, life okay. happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, we decided that we would sell up in Scotland where we were living at the time and and go have this adventure you know it was the time that we could do it we could move to France and we could do up a crazy falling down old farmhouse and and um, try new things we tried working in the wine industry and I became a yoga teacher because I'd always loved doing yoga so it was a it was a really um creative opportunity I guess for about for really for the first time in my life you know I'd always I'd always worked full-time in an office job I'd been busy bringing up my two boys um suddenly I had time and I also most importantly had the inspiration living in France um just because it was such a magical adventure and that place you know there was romance about it um and the first three books I wrote were were quite romantic sort of rom-com type books okay about about you know people from outside of France moving to French of love is that yes the French French of French for love yeah and the French for Christmas yeah so those those were the first three and um that's what got me started and to my absolute amazement somebody wanted to publish them and then to my even more amazement people wanted to read them and that was just you know blew me away um but while I was living there in France I the, the house that we had was in an area that had been right on the demarcation line between the occupied and unoccupied part of the country during World War II Oh, wow. And um, and this is the big irony of this. I, I'm now uh, quite often I'm, um, you know, my, I'm introduced as a writer of historical fiction. 
when I was at school, I didn't pass a history test ever, ever. <laughs> I, I, history was not my subject. Oh, um, the irony, and, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. So I just, I just hope my history teachers have read some of my books <laughs> since. It has a funny way of laughing at us. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but I think it was really having it brought to life for me by, by being in that part of France where even though it's 70, 80 years ago now, it's still just underneath the surface. Yeah. What being in a divided country and an occupied country did to communities and to even to the generations today right. um, is still really relevant and really there just these little that's, undercurrents that's something that we don't particularly have yeah. in our country because same while, same in britain yeah there's yeah. a lot of people that maybe have fought in the war yeah and, and i think that you know our country had you know where you had to cut back on things you did you know there was rationing yeah. and things like that but yeah, you know, there was no line down the middle of our country where no, this one was no. occupied and this one wasn't. Yeah. And, so or, or, and being occupied by an enemy invader who so that yeah. you know, from one day to the next, everything changes. The rules change, yeah. the laws change, you all the rights that you thought you had, everything that you'd, you know, voted for or worked for or contributed to. It's just like someone's taken a pen and drawn a line through it. And that has a really lasting effect on on cultures as well as on the individual people and the communities right and so it was as i was living in france and, and it took time because they people in france still don't like talking about these things it's kept yeah. under the surface but slowly i got to know my friends and neighbors and these little stories would come out and Oh, it was so fascinating, so moving. I would imagine, so yeah. That, that then took me in that direction. So, in fact, since my first three books, which were really contemporary novels, everything I've written since then has had a World War II strand. I, I was noticing that, yeah. yeah. How interesting. And so how did the Morocco piece come about? Uh, that was it. That was Morocco it. or? No. And full confession here, everybody, I still haven't been to Morocco and I blame the <laughs> pandemic completely for that. I'm one of those authors who looks down very much down her nose at, at, at people who don't go and do their research in the country. <laughs> who can possibly write about it if you don't know it? Oh, I could be so high and mighty about that. And so um, I, uh, I, I've never been to Morocco. It's not a country that I knew much about, but, but the, the idea for the story came through a chance email that I received from a gentleman living in America. Oh. And he read what, a couple of my other World War II based novels and sent me this beautiful email saying how much he'd enjoyed them and how much he enjoyed, uh, although, you know, they're, they're harrowing and they're, they, right. they don't shy away from the, 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 the awful reality of what happened. Um, but he then said, a little throwaway line, I really wish that somebody would write down my, my wife's story of being a um, Jewish refugee in Casablanca during World War II. Oh. Little throwaway line. Oh. So I, that got me wondering, and I thought, well, that's yeah. really interesting. So I emailed him back, but I, I think he was quite an elderly gentleman, and I, I got the impression that his wife wasn't with us anymore okay and I and so I I just sent a very gentle message thanking him obviously and saying how delighted I was that he'd he'd read my books and and responded in that way and got in touch and if he ever wanted to share any any of his wife's story I'd love to know more okay I didn't get a reply and that's fine you know I'm yeah. not gonna I'm not gonna go there I'm not gonna try and intrude there that's that's his story that's his wife's story but it just got me wondering. I thought, why do I not know anything about this? I've now written whatever it was, you know, four books about World War II, three of them set in France. Why do I not know about what People happened going to in Morocco. Casablanca? Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. the minute you say Casablanca, we all see Humphrey Bogart. There yeah. he is. We all know the film. The mystery and the, yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, and it's that, it is that very gripping film. And yet that's one tiny strand of what was going on there. And so I started to try and dig and do a bit of research of my own. 
and um, found these stories, you know, that the figures are astonishing of the number of the, the tide of refugees yeah. that washed up literally on the shores of Morocco at Casablanca, because that was as far wow. as they could get. So you had the whole of Europe pouring into North Africa, trying to leave, trying to get away, not just from France, but from all the other countries as well. Wow. Um, because once Europe was occupied by the Germans, the way out was to get to Casablanca and get a, a boat to, to Portugal. Right. And from Port on usually to the to America to the United States, um, so this tide of humanity washed up there. All different wow. backgrounds, all different cultures. Did they uh, come through Spain? No, they, they mostly came France. through France, through Marseille, okay. Okay. and then they, 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 it's exactly the the journey that um, Josie takes in the book. Okay, so they, they came to Marseille, and then they had to get a boat to Algeria. Okay. Which French, you know, a French protectorate, and then from okay. Algeria, they were then bussed into into Morocco, and okay. and, and then the into the refugee camp, camp, which was the big port, okay. and and they had these um, these refugee camps there for yeah. these thousands of people, and I knew nothing about this, yeah. and but the other fascinating thing about um, about Morocco and Casablanca in particular is that. We think of refugees as being people who have nothing, who've who've had to leave and, and you know, are, are living in terrible conditions and and, you know, really have, have left everything behind. But some of these people were extremely wealthy. They had good connections. They could afford to live as Josie's family do. Right. In quite a nice house, you know, in the new town and have a have people looking after them there and they had some money so they could they could sit it out and they could so, so although they were running for their lives and they were refugees they were actually then living this very strange life of plunging themselves into this very different culture and quite right. often getting stuck there for a long time yeah so a lot of the stories that that come out of 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 Morocco during that time is exactly that people getting stuck there because there were these really complicated hurdles that you had to jump over to get all your paperwork lined up you had yeah. to entry visas exit visas transit visas and then they they talk about um the queues at the consulates and that would become what you did during the day you just hang queued. out with all those same people with yeah thousands of other people so wow. you know all of that was part of my inspiration um, interesting. So the minute I started doing that research and I just thought, ah, this is a fantastic book. This is the book I'm going to write. I immediately booked being a being a good author and one who looks down on people who don't go and do their <laughs> research in the country. I booked my trip. And then, of course, pandemic happened. The world shut down. I rebooked that trip three times oh. and each time it was cancelled again. So I never, I still haven't got there, but I, I did try and find other ways of doing my research. And it's amazing how many people will, will talk to you <laughs> if you're mad yeah. enough like me, just to ask and just to say, to ask, you know, silly questions. Um, and I spoke to one wonderful lady who's in her late eighties now, and she'd been a French um, child living in Morocco during oh, those wow. years. So she was, you know, she was gold dust. She was absolutely fantastic. Um, what she had, she hadn't been a refugee. Her father had been sent uh, as part of this kind of French administration to go and work there. Oh, okay. okay. She didn't have that element to her story. Um, but she could tell me what life would have been like for Josie on a day-to-day -day basis. How so interesting. That really wow. Cool. Yeah. And then, well, and then I... I gleaned things wherever I could, you know, here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, and I mean, you did a good job of um, making us feel like you had been there. Good. <laughs> because <laughs> I felt like you had, you know, at the very least, you had done your research between yeah. the sounds and the smells and the tastes. Yeah. I mean, you hit all yeah. of the right notes to make us feel like we, are, we had seen Casablanca, so... Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, that and I mean that's one of the my sort of 
trademark elements, if you like, of my other books. It's, I think that came out of my time in France and starting to write living in France. You know, I really wanted to transport people so that they were smelling the smells and tasting yeah. the food and, and enjoying that. The intangible things that mm -hmm. make you really feel like you're there when you're when exactly. you're in a book. And so it was really important to me with, with the Casablanca book not to lose that. So I had to find ways of, of, of researching that and finding it out. And one of the, one of the best um, bits was um, when the family go to fairs and they visit the tanneries and there are wonderful descriptions because apparently, again, I've never visited a tannery, but apparently it is a smell unlike anything else you have ever come across. I believe so that. That was great to be able to sort of get in and try and describe the nitty gritty of that awfulness. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. Well, thank you for joining us today. This has been so much fun. And we really enjoyed reading about Morocco and exploring that with you and your characters. That's always such a treat to jump into a an author's mind for a little while. So thank you for doing that with us. No, really thank all of you for, for buying my book, for reading my book, for, for wanting to be here to, to talk today. And um, yeah, I'm just so grateful to you all and really glad to hear that it was, it was well received. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Have everybody. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining me today on the Literary Escape Podcast. If you enjoy hearing the behind the book story, then join me in the Literary Escape Society. We're a community of travelers who love books, or maybe book lovers who love to travel. Either way, if you need an escape, a literary escape, come join us as we read our way around the world together, one book at a time. Check out the show notes to learn more about the Literary Escape Society. And we'll see you next time on the next episode.